Artificial intelligence combined with investing has become a very topical discussion point, especially when we look at behavioral science and the way people invest. It's about finding ways for machine learning or AI to help improve investor well-being and their outcomes by combining technology with psychology. I've asked Paul Nixon, head of behavioral finance at Momentum Investments, to provide us with some insights into these developments. Here is what he had to say. Right, thank you very much for having me, everyone. And uh, today I'm very, very briefly going to talk to you about this whole combination or coming together of psychology and, and AI and technology, which is something I find particularly interesting. Um, now, there was recently an article published by uh, the Nobel Prize winner uh, for economics in 2015, Angus Deaton, who really gave quite a scathing account of economics and, and, and the direction that economics has gone into and, and not really serving uh, serving real people simply because economics focused, focuses too much rather on, you know, the monetary aspect of of, um, of utility and doesn't focus enough on people's well-being. And I think that this is really the interesting place that the world finds itself at at the moment. I mean, in the beginning of the year, we had this chat GPT storm, which has died down a little bit, although there have been, you know, a million and one apps that have popped up in, in, you know, in terms of using AI. But um, at the same time, the world is looking, you know, we're looking at the four day work week, for example. So, you know, we're, we're looking or, you know, the world has entered this empathy economy and, you know, turning towards psychology and away from economics. So how does all the stuff fit together? I mean, how does this fit together with AI, with, with psychology, um, you know, with economics, for example, how does all this kind of stuff fit together? And, and this is really what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. So our approach really at, um, at Momentum Investments, you know, in, in, in trying to improve investor well-being and improve their outcomes is really to try and combine machine learning with psychology to help people make better investment decisions. And that's really the best summary that I can give of that. And I mean, if we look at very briefly how this comes together, and it's just one slide I'm going to talk about, you know, for the next few minutes, you know, on the machine learning side, we are using two techniques or two ways of looking at the world. We look at the world through the lens of unsupervised machine learning and unsupervised just basically is a very, very good way that machines can, or an algorithm can look at a real big stack of data. So, you know, from 2014, um, actually a little bit earlier than that until 2020, um, 2022, you know, we, we identified four statistically significant behavioral patterns you know that so you know we had four identified patterns of behavior from market timers so we could clearly identify those people that are greedy when other people are greedy and fearful when other people are fearful and by the way the market timers uh, since COVID have consistently destroyed the most amounts of value right and you would expect that in markets that are going up and down you know so they tend to lose on both sides of that equation we also identify a group called the assertive investors. So those are your performance traces out there, constantly up-risking and, and, um, and chasing past investment performance. Then we had the anxious investors. Those are the loss-averse investors. So they take risk, but at the first sign of market turbulence, they, they tend to, to de-risk their portfolios. And then finally, the avoiders who just don't take a lot of risk and they kind of get stuck there. So, so the behavior tax, or that's how we really quantify how investors are destroying value. You know, if the decisions that they're making are improving or detracting from value, but the behavior tax for the avoiders is the lowest, but also slightly different because obviously if you get stuck in safe assets, um, you incur, or at least you have a low chance of, of beating or hurdling inflation, for example. So, so that's how supervised machine learning, which can take a long, a big period, a big chunk of data over time can reveal patterns, right? So, so how is the, with this concept of the behavior tax not everyone destroys value in the same way at the same time. And the four patterns I've just told you about now clearly show that at different times, there are different groups of people destroying, um, destroying value. So the behavior tax is not evenly distributed. The next part of that, though, really is taking that into the predictive realm. So, you know, so it's all very fine well knowing about these behavior patterns, but how do we, how do we predict what people are likely to do? And in this case, we turn to the realm or the world of supervised machine learning. And supervised machine learning, we use a technique called random forests that is very, very good at predicting behavior, but also very, very good at squeezing or sucking out features um, of investor or other behavior in the sense 
from a set of data. In other words, if we tell the algorithm that switching is important, so moving from or you know, from one unit trust to another is important, we can ask that algorithm using a random forest technique to squeeze out what the most important things are to investors when they make switch decisions. And that's really, really important and useful information. And as it turns out, the most important things to investors when they make switch, switch decisions are, um, you know, sort of risk preference related. So their age and the size of their portfolios makes kind of sense. If you think about sort of the older, you know, the older someone is, the more they have to lose. And also the more, the bigger the size of their portfolio, the more they've got to lose. Past performance, very, very big indicator, relative and absolute. So people are looking at their portfolios in comparison to other similar portfolios. They're also looking at their portfolio comparison in absolute terms. So whether it's um, how far away from zero is it on both sides, by the way. And the final thing is their belief system. So if someone has switched before, they are likely to switch again. So it's the, the kind of Pringles analogy. You know, once you pop, you, you find it difficult to stop. So those are the three things that the machine learning tells us are very, very important. And we take that forward into a very, very strong predictive model of investor behavior. So ultimately we can inform advisors or clients, um, you know, when a group of their clients or which group of their clients are likely to switch within the next 30, 60 or 90 days. And those are really, really important insights in terms of minimizing and controlling this behavior tax because it gives us really, really good insights in terms of proactively engage, in, engaging our clients. And then we can also use behavioral science principles as well because there are different nudging techniques we can use based on, you know, based on the kind of behavior that we are trying to stop or rather avoid. Now, that, com that covers the machine learning. Now, on the right-hand side of your screens there, that, that deals with the psychology piece. So another very, very good predictor of behavior is psychology. Now, psychology has just been built into the CFP, into the CFP syllabus. It's now about 7 or 8% of the syllabus. The UK regula regulator is also starting to talk about psychological suitability in terms of investment suitability. And I find that very interesting because, you know, we can think of people's personality or psychological traits in respect of whether a product is suitable. In other words, are they likely to keep or stick to that product? You know, and, and in this way, we can relate that directly to the behavior tax again, because we see this consistent and persistent behavior of switching money around, which ultimately erodes value. And since COVID has consistently destroyed, destroyed value for investors. Now on your screens there you can see OCEAN and OCEAN is the acronym you can you can use to remember the five or the big five personality traits that most of us have. But I think the most important thing then, the reason why two of them are highlighted is that those two are particularly important or they transfer very well between, um, between different domains. And what I mean by that basically is you can look at those traits mapping very, very well to invest investment behavior, driving behavior, adherence to medicine behavior. So you can you can map these across domains and they tend to give you very important insights in terms of those various domains. And very, very briefly to end off with, these two traits are called conscientiousness. And conscientiousness, those are the kids who left the marshmallow basically on the table. So if you remember the very, very famous Stanford marshmallow experiments, you know, the kids who were able to very, very quickly develop techniques to you know, cover the marshmallow, move away from it so they could smell it, you know, look to the corner of the room. Those are the kids who had good factory settings for savings. So, so by the way, our personality comes directly through our genetic code. Over 50% of our personality is, is inherited, and that's already been mapped to areas of, our, of, um, of the human genome. Um, so conscientiousness gives us an indication of whether that person is present orientated. So very casual, very relaxed, kind of, you know, whatever will be, will be. Um, doesn't like too much uh, order, you know, doesn't like too much planning and structure in life, likes to be more, um, you know, sort of a bit more of kind of impulsive, if you can think of it that way, versus people who have high conscientiousness being very ordered, very structured, and very good at focusing on the future. And that's the important element here. So conscientiousness is all about whether you focus on the present or the future. The last one is neuroticism, which is your level, you know, the, the amount of time or the amount of times you activate the fight or flight response. And the more often you activate fight or flight, the more cortisol you're going to have flowing through your, bread, uh, your bloodstream rather. And, you know, the Wharton Business School has shown that, you know, if you have cortisol in your bloodstream, you're going to be far more likely to act on gut instinct, which means your you know, access to your logical thinking center is blocked during activation of fight or flight. So it should be clear that from an investments perspective, those of us who have high levels of conscientiousness and low levels of neuroticism have good factory settings for savings. 
the reverse is true. Those of us who have high levels of neuroticism and low levels of conscientiousness, we're in the danger zone in terms of, of this investment behavior. So really combining or looking at these, these two dimensions, integrating them, um, it gives us a very, very good way of combining machine learning with psychology to give um, investors better insights into their own behave, in behavior rather, and help them to, to get better investment outcomes and make better investment decisions, both them and indeed their advisors. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed today's very brief chat and um, all the best. See you soon.